Alright. Welcome everybody. I'm online now. Uh, we got about five minutes until we start up. I have two people in class today with me, so we'll be talking back and forth. Um, but like always, uh, if you guys have anything you want to say, message in the chat there. I'll answer them on camera. Today's class is going to be camera basics, so we'll go over um, everything for shooting through your camera, graduating from your smartphone, and moving on to the next step. So we got more people joining. So, hi everybody, welcome in. Yeah, good to see you. Welcome in. So I just set up online as well, so now we have four students. Um, but camera basics today, so we're going to learn very basic information about how to shoot through your camera, take a good photo. Um, you're basically moving from your smartphone over to a real camera of sorts. Uh, and yeah. And then, do either of you guys want water? I know that you have brought a drink in. Would you like yeah. water? Yeah, I gotcha. So class usually goes for about an hour, I talk, so around 6.30 is when we'll stop, maybe a little sooner than that, and then it's all questions. So from there, anything you got a question on. Um, like I said earlier, it's pretty basic as far as what we talk about. Um, mainly, is uh, everything is going to be on auto for the camera, it's composition, um, how to transfer photos properly, and then some other light photo stuff. Next week is where we then get into more of the technical aspects. So f-stop, aperture, shutter mm -hmm. speed, I, I call it the exposure triangle and everything that gets involved with that. But as you guys have questions, shout them out to me, I'll answer them. And I told the same thing for these guys online. So they'll answer with any questions that they have in the chat and then we'll just go from there. Are you doing like the manual settings? That's next, That's next week. week. That's yep. But if there's something that you got on that too, and we have time, please ask, and I can try to answer it as quickly as possible. It is the first Thursday. Yes. Oh, the you yes. So camera basics is the first Thursday. The second Thursday of the month is intermediate uh, oh, okay. camera. We take a break on the third, and then the final Thursday of the month is GoPro action. Okay. That's what? GoPro and action based cameras. Yeah, those tiny little guys, um, there's the GoPro, there's um, an Insta360 camera, which is kind of similar. The idea is they're durable, they're video-based cameras, you can technically go underwater with them, throw them at a wall, they still work. They're really nice for like action or sports videos, but it's mainly video, not photo. Okay. Yeah. And they take up a lot of space, I'm assuming. Depends on what, you, what you're doing. Um, Typically with video, they do take up more space than a standard photo because they have a different read and write speed. But it, it comes down to what video quality you're using and then what frames per second you're doing. So if you're doing 4K at the highest frame rate you can do, um, you'll probably on a 128 gigabyte SD card get 60 minutes out of that. Um, if you're doing, let's say, like 1080, which is just a standard HD video, maybe you're doing 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second, you might be able to squeeze out an hour and 45 minutes to 90 or, yeah, hour and 45 minutes, I'd say, at the most. So that, that's a whole different thing, but yeah. Another minute or so, and then we'll get started. So we don't really talk too much about that stuff, but I can always, again, after talk to you a little bit more about that, show you what apps to download on the phone and whatnot. Snapridge is the one from Nikon. It's, right. it's very cool. Oh, yeah. It's very easy to use. Huh. And you just uh, download it onto your phone? I download it onto my phone and then I move the photos to Dropbox. Oh, perfect. Yeah, if you want to transfer it to your computer, can you download it onto your computer too? I, I typically do it with my phone just because yeah. it's, I'm usually near my phone when I do it. 
Um, from what I understand, you can't do Wi-Fi transfer to the computer. You okay. can do plug into the computer. Wi-Fi transfer will only go through the phone. Okay, yeah. yeah. I at least I haven't tried it on the computer myself. But typically, the only reason you want to do Wi-Fi transfer or Bluetooth transfer is to just get the images to your phone quickly, so you can send them out right. or text them. It does eat the battery up a pretty good chunk, and it right. does it'll it'll kill the battery pretty quickly. So, do you have the CF Express card, which is the first time I've ever used that? Is that what's in your camera, or do you just have an SD card? Just an SD card. So, I wind up if we're traveling. I have an adapter so that I can transfer the photos. Um, I usually tra like if you're traveling, I transfer them to a tablet or my phone, and then I load them into Dropbox so that I get them off and I'm not, you know, filling up the memory. And um, then I don't use Snapbridge. I just do a direct transfer. You mm -hmm. never use Dropbox. Mm -hmm. That's just I have like 150,000 photos, so it's, wow. <laughs> I did somewhere to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're just transferring like 10 or 12 images, you can put them right to your photos, so whatever your main app is for right. photos. So if it's um, at the Apple or iPhone that you're using, the photo app, if it's Samsung, your gallery it's app. Average. so it's a Nikon. Yeah. Yes. an AP. Yeah, Snapbridge, one word. B-R-I-D-G. Yeah, E, yeah. So it'll just, it'll, you just took it up, you know, put your Wi-Fi information and it'll link right in. Wow. All right. And well, that you can download it. right in. Oh, well, I have Android, so. Okay. Should be, it download free. it, yeah, it should be free. Okay. So we'll jump in. So camera basics, welcome everybody. So first slide, where to go to help when all else fails. First off, thanks for coming in person. Thanks to everybody who's online today. Um, this is one way to get help with the cameras. Um, coming into in person, going to class, doing that, that's a great way to start. I always recommend, the first thing you should always do when getting a, a car, uh, a camera, a cell phone, read the manual. Um, just take a look at it first. Just get an idea, familiar with it. Um, while almost every camera is the same, um, they're very different all around. They basic are going to do all the basic functions that you know and love. They're going to take a photo, take video. Some are going to have built-in stabilization. Others won't. Um, some are going to have an autofocus that's going to be manual with a motor uh, or have, have a motor. Others are going to be manual. Um, so it's important to kind of get a better feel for your camera by going through the operation manual first before doing anything else. YouTube is another great example. I tell customers all the time, if you really want to learn more about your camera, type in your camera's name and 10 facts you didn't know about it and you'll find out something that you had no clue on. Uh, might be a little more than what you currently need to get started with it, but it could be another option, especially if you're a little more advanced. Um, and then Masterclass, that was one I threw on not long ago. During the pandemic, Masterclass really came to the forefront with um, offerings to get better at certain crafts, uh, learn new skills, and do all of these new things. Um, there's some really cool master classes out there and there's some really awesome photo ones. I know you pay monthly for it, but there's a lot of different ones out there you can look into. So first things first, taking photos. Where do pictures go? Make sure you have two. Depending on the style of camera you have, you're probably going to use one of four different types of SD cards. There's the standard SD card that can come in SDXC or SDHC. They really don't have HC anymore. You're really only going to see XCs nowadays. Um, that's going to have the higher or the faster read and write speed. Um, but read and write speed is a big part of SD card, so pay attention to that when you're purchasing one. The higher you go on that, the faster it is with transferring photos the better it is for photo quality, um, and then just transferring back and forth and whatnot. From SD cards, there's also compact disc cards, which you don't typically see much anymore. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome in. Thank you. Uh, there's compact disc cards as well. You don't see those too much anymore, um, but some cameras still will have them. CF Express, which we were just talking about, there's type A and type B. Depending on the age of, or depending on the camera that you have, some of the higher end cameras that you'll see from, I would say, intermediate to more advanced levels will use the CF Express cards. CF, 
part of me. CF Express is a, a great way for you to store high quality photo and video in the raw format. Um, regular SDXC should be able to handle it, but at the same time, it's going to eat up a lot more of that space. Um, the CF Express is better for that. And then there's micro SD cards, which, at least to my knowledge, no standard camera takes an S a micro SD card. Mm -hmm. Things like GoPros take a micro SD card. Um, things like the Action from DJI take a, a micro SD card. Um, but a lot of the times, if you do have a micro SD, you can get an adapter for it, which will then allow you to use it on your camera. Um, I say I always have two of these guys. You know, there's always a possibility of an SD card failing. Water damage is something that once these things get wet, they're fried, and for you to lose all of your photos, it's that could be really sad. So having two SD cards, I think, is a must. I have six that I travel with when I'm taking photos, just to be on the safe side. Two that are 128, one that's a 16 gigabyte, and then the rest are 64. Um, a standard JPEG that's in a nicer quality, I would say if you have a 64 gigabyte SD card, you're probably looking at about 40,000 photos. So two SD cards should suffice no matter what. But it's important to know what you have and to, to understand what you have a little bit before you throw it in your camera, especially if you're taking video or if you're just doing photo, if you're doing photo as a JPEG or if you're doing photo in RAW. It's important to know what you're using so that way you kind of gauge how much space that you have. So mine says Ultra Plus on it. Well, it should say more on there. So it should sell you SD and then have a, num a number. Yeah, it's SD-128. It should say more than that too, though. It'll probably say something else on there too, so we can take a look at that. You can ask questions during this. Don't don't no, don't worry. Any any questions that you have, we do it in camera as well. But they can ask questions online, just like you guys can ask in person. So don't ever feel like you can't ask. But let's see. With your card. So this is an SDXC, and you can see it right on the top there. It says SDXC. So you got a fast read and write speed, 130 megabytes per second, 128. So it's a high quality SD card. Uh, this is a little quote I like to put on there. But the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. Uh, it's always great to get the best deal you can. I'd say the one thing with photography is that the more money you put into photography, the better your photos and everything comes out. And that's, that is the sad truth with photography. A lot of skill that goes into taking a quality image, but at the end of the day, a lot of the time is it's how much and how, what you're putting into the physical item. Uh, so your pictures don't live on your memory card. It's important to remember that the memory card is the first way that the camera is saving the image, but from there, it's important that we get the image off of the SD card and we get it into other storage solutions. So my kind of five or six step approach to making sure that you're putting your picture, pictures onto your um, computer or onto a source properly, first step, turn off your camera. You've taken a bunch of photos on vacation, you're done, turn the camera off, wait a few seconds, I like to say at least five at minimum. You're gonna remove the SD card out of it, out of the camera, and you're gonna place it into a card reader. Um, I like to use the card reader method because it allows for, me, at least for me, to make sure that my camera's turned off and that I'm now going to take my photos and move them into its proper location. Um, some people will rather keep the SD card inside the camera and they'll use a multi-port that's on, si on the side of your camera. The multi-port can be a USB-C or a micro USB and from there you can plug it in. It should charge the battery at the same time and on your computer it should populate as the camera itself or then you can remove the photos. So you can take the SD card out or you can plug in. Some cameras, depending on the age, don't have the multi-port, so if you try to plug in, it might do nothing for you, so you're going to have to take the SD card out. Um, that depends on the age of the camera. I'd say if your camera's above 10 years old, you should be fine. Anything below that, you're most likely going to have to pop that SD card out every time. A good SD card reader that you can get, so there's multiple ways that you can go about this. Um, I'm a big fan of the one in the middle, the trifecta. It plugs into a USB or a USB-C plug really simply, and then on the sides of it, it actually has the slots for where you can put a micro SD or a standard SD. If you're someone who's using a CF Express, Sony makes a CF Express reader, which is really popular, 
I believe it works for both type A and type B, which is pretty unique. Um, ProMaster also has their uh, Velocity Zine one, which will do compact flash and the um, CF Express. Again, you don't see a lot of compact flashes anymore, but they still are used if you have an older camera. It was a compact flash basically was what was before the CF Express. So it's what stored your raw or your um, higher format files. But any SD card is a good, any SD card reader that you can get would be appropriate. They should be marked anywhere between 15, 20 bucks at the cheapest. Some of the CF Express or the compact disc readers will go up to maybe 100 bucks at the worst. Um, but I definitely would recommend having one just in case something's faulty, especially too, if there's some issue with the um, camera's card reader. If you just try to plug in the SD card, or try to plug in the camera to the computer, it might not give you anything. So that could be a nice indication to you that your SD card reader on the inside of the camera is broken too, which might save you if you go out and take a bunch of photos and then nothing's saved to the physical camera. So kind of keeping keeping into that area now when you've you've got the photos you've done everything with getting them off of the SD card what do you do with them I like to say that there's a few extra steps to this so the first thing is copy photos to a destination um, folder don't move copy them when you physically move an item um, you're taking it from one location and moving it to the other meaning that it's not going to double up on the copies and that means it moved it to one location so if that one location goes down you lose those photos completely it's a good idea to copy the photos so that way you have multiple copies of the photos rather than just one um, the example I use is I went to the School of the Art Institute for college I'm a painter and a drawer is my background during school we had to take photos of all of our work to make sure that we could document our practice but then also to just have record that we did this um, there were a lot of times where you'd be working on a project you'd move the wrong way you'd spill a cup of coffee on your work and it was gone uh, and especially if it was electronics it was fried there's no saving that so one of the things they would tell us is to save it on your computer and then to buy a one terabyte hard drive and store it all on there I actually have two, two, I have two one terabyte hard drives that I keep in my house. One is my go-to, I save everything on it right away. The other one I save it all onto and then I lock it into a safe at the end of my day when I'm done saving everything just in case the house catches on fire, anything were to happen, I have all of my work for the past two decades on a hard drive safe, ready to go for galleries and whatnot. Um, so I'm a big stickler on copying my photos from one place to another or any video or anything that I'm doing. Um, so the kind of the form of backup would be moving it from your SD card to your computer, creating another destination folder from your computer on, on there uh, that you can then double up and copy everything over to. And then from there, using one of the three options on the bottom, so an external drive, Prime Photos or Google Drive. It's a little dated because there's other forms of cloud-based computing out there that you can use that are a little bit better. But an external drive is what I'm talking about when I say a one terabyte drive. It's a hard drive that plugs into the side of the computer via USB. You can save anything you want to it, video files, photo files, what have you. Um, Google Drive, Prime Photos, those are examples of cloud-based solutions. And I get a lot of people that get confused when it comes to the cloud. Any Apple users in here are familiar with iCloud. Some people don't know what that is. Other people hate it, don't use it. The idea is that where an external drive, it's all located on one physical, tangible item that you can hold in your hand. The cloud is above you, and that's why they call it a cloud. It follows you around like a rain cloud would. Anything that you put into the cloud can be accessed anywhere in the world. So if you're taking pictures in Chicago and then you go to Europe and you're in Poland and you're taking photos and you want to look at all the photos you did in Chicago, you can pull up your photo drive, your cloud, and then see everything that you've taken. And you can store things that way um, and not have to necessarily take up space on a device like a cell phone or a hard drive. It all lives in the cloud. Isn't Explorer gone now? Yeah. Internet Explorer is gone now, but it's still Windows. I forgot what it's called now, but it is a Windows program. Um, but yeah, it's technically Explorer did expire about a month or so ago. After you've done everything with the photos, now it's important that you properly remove the card from the computer or that you properly eject the computer. So typically, 
on a Windows or a, on a Windows based computer on a Dell based computer if you click on the bottom right corner there should be an eject button for whatever you've plugged into your computer so you can eject from there if you're using an Apple based computer you should be able to drag the item into the trash can and then it'll eject the item um, but either way you want to properly eject it because sometimes the, the SD card or the card reader isn't finished doing its operation so if it's transferring something and you cut it during the middle of the transfer it could permanently delete the item uh, it could misplace the item it could improperly transfer and there could be something is uh, an issue with the read and write of what you were doing so it's important that when you're done using the SD card the CF Express card the compact disc you properly eject it from the computer um, format card in the camera that's another one I add on there so after you're done and you physically remove it put the SD card back into the camera right away. Sometimes your camera will want you to reformat the card before you can use it again, other times it doesn't. Typically you don't see a lot of the format in cards now with the mirrorless cameras or the newer cameras, but older Nikon or Canon models, that does come up every once in a while. Backup plan, so this is again going into the different storage for the cameras and the devices. So it starts with the SD card, it moves to the computer, you can always just leave it on the computer. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're like me, you're nervous, you're scared, finding a solution like a one terabyte hard drive, which usually comes with a cable like that, plugs into the computer, or using a cloud-based solution is a really great idea, and I highly recommend it. Um, cloud-based solutions have becoming more and more popular. You pay monthly for them, especially when you want higher storage. But if you're like me and you're traveling places, you don't want a tangible item because you're nervous of losing or misplacing it, as long as you can remember a username password, a cloud-based solution is a really nice idea. Cloud-based solutions to try. So Google Drive, been around forever. I like Google Drive a lot. Microsoft offers one called OneDrive, um, but my personal favorite is the Adobe Creative Cloud. If you are interested at all in doing any type of editing to your photos, videos, when you're getting to that point, the Creative Cloud not only lets you store photos and videos on there, but then it also lets you use things like InDesign, Lightroom, Photoshop, all of the different programs that can help with color, saturation, editing, all of that software. Um, so not only can you store it on there, but then you can also edit and um, physically manipulate all of your photos and videos. So a tour of your camera. So let's break down your camera. This is my introduction for, let's say you didn't read the owner's manual, the operating manual. This gives you a better insight. For the most part, all of your cameras should look somewhat similar, minus a couple things here and there. The camera we'll be using, for example, is going to be a Nikon. It's a DSLR. I believe this is the D5600. Um, DSLR to mirrorless, we can start to, start to talk about that difference first. DSLR has a built-in mirror on the inside and mirrorless does not. When you're using a DSLR camera, light is being reflected, or reflected off of certain items. From there, it's entering the inside of the camera. There is a mirror on the inside of the camera that's tilted upwards. So when, that, when, the, um, when the subject matter you're taking a photo of, when its information comes into the camera, it hits the mirror, it bounces up, and the sensor for the camera lives on the top. So where you put your eye up to that viewfinder on there, technically on the inside of that camera, that's where your sensor is. So with a DSLR and a mirrorless, DSLRs are going to weigh maybe an ounce to three or four ounces heavier than a mirrorless. The DSLR is going to take a little bit more of a precise image and be able to lock in more information, but it's going to be heavier, bulkier, and it can damage more easily. With a mirrorless camera, it's going to work better in low light situation, it's going to weigh less, and you don't have that mirror on the inside, so you have less room for breaking things or for things to go awry in the future. To start, our video stop and start button. So if we look on the top of our camera, we'll see a red dot, or sometimes we'll see a circle that has a red line going around it. That is our video start and stop button. Some people will have it, some people won't, um, but you'll see it usually somewhere next to the video capture button or the picture capture button on the top. From there we have our power switch. Typically our power switch will have, be labeled on and off on there and we'll have a little um, in place dial for what where you're at. 
Most of the time it's a toggle switch that's going to be next to the shutter release, and that's what's in the center of that image right there. So the shutter release on the Nikon D5600 lives in the middle of the camera, uh, or in, in the middle of the um, on and off switch. Under that, we're then going to have the shutter release, or sorry, we're going to have the exposure. Oops. Uh-oh. I know my video feed's still on, so it's something with this. Technical error. Give me one second. There we go. All right, hopefully that stays on and doesn't switch on me. Anyway, so exposure comp. So when you're using the camera and you have your eye up to the viewfinder, if you click the exposure comp, you should be able to get an exposure meter that pops up on the bottom of the screen there. What that's then going to do is it helps you with your light and dictate what your light is. So you should see it as a set of numbers, and we talk a little bit more about this in the intermediate class, uh, but it basically will show you um, a grouping or a, um, a set of notches on the bottom. And then you'll have one bar that will consist, consistently fluctuate between the two. What that's doing is it's metering the light through the viewfinder so you find the perfect example of where the light should be. And typically, wherever that meter then meets the middle, that's where then you know that your exposure is directly in the center. Underneath that is the mode dial. So the mode dial is going to be what switches between all of the different settings on your camera. Um, auto is what we're going to be first learning about. That's the most basic one to start with. That's where you're letting the camera choose everything for you. We'll talk a little bit more about all the different modes, um, but auto is going to be the main one that we're looking at today. Live switch view. So you should see an LV with a square somewhere on the camera. Typically for the Nikon, it's at the top there, but it's a toggle feature that switches between the live view of your viewfinder and the LCD screen on the camera. So if you're someone who doesn't really want to use the LCD screen, you rather look through the viewfinder every time, you can click the live view button and it'll switch between the two. If you're someone that likes to use the LCD and the viewfinder, you can set it up where with that button, It'll go through on the screen first, and the second that you put your eye up to the physical viewfinder, it'll automatically switch over to that. The screen then goes black. So there's a little sensor on there. And then the last thing is the command dial. When you see the command dial on the top there, and different brands do it a little bit differently. Sometimes it's just a movable piece on the camera. Other times it almost looks like the mode dial up there. Let's say that you're doing a shutter priority or an f-stop priority. Um, when you're going through that, the command dial will rotate that for you. So I use the shutter and the f-stop prior, or the shutter and this, um, the shutter and the aperture priority as my example. When you're moving that, the dial will then change the speed of the shutter. Everything else will be controlled automatically by the camera. If you're doing the um, aperture, that'll be controlled by the command dial, and the camera will then do the rest of the work for you. So those are some settings that when you're using. The command dial is what you're using to rotate between certain features on the camera that you're trying to change or edit. And it'll, the command dial will basically shift depending on what mode you have it in, or what it is you're trying to move. From the side button, we have our flash. So if you're shooting in auto, the camera automatically can dictate when you're using flash and when you're not, so it knows when you're in a low light situation or you're not. If you are in full manual or you're in an aperture or a shutter priority, you can click the flash button and it should automatically pull the flash up and let you to start using it. Some of the mirrorless cameras that you're going to see nowadays will not have a flash on there. A lot of the mirrorless cameras are powerful enough that they work in low light situations where where a, mirror, or where a mirrored DSLR camera needed a flash, the mirrorless doesn't. Um, now let's say you're shooting, and I get a lot of parents that come in that do prom photos or homecoming photos. Let's say you're in a situation where you have no light, it's pitch black, it's dark. You can always buy an external flash that goes onto the hot shoe mount of each of your cameras, um, and you can use a flash that way. And they sell inexpensive ones that go anywhere from 100 bucks to you know, $150. Um, and they could go all the way up to six, seven hundred dollars for a flash, but I don't really think that it's the most necessary. 
Um, from there, we have our function button. Typically with the function button, it's something that you can set yourself. So a lot of the times when you see an FN button on the camera, it either means that it can do a multi-function purpose, so it'll open up certain settings, it'll open up different features in the camera, but a lot of the times you can set the function button to do whatever it is that you want it to do. Um, so I know on my camera, for instance, when I press the function button, it opens up a um, menu setting that I would have to dig through my camera in order to get to. So this opens up my menu a little bit faster than if I had to sit there and dig through the menu and try to find it. Zoom ring and focus ring, they're both pretty similar. The focus ring is going to be used if you're not using autofocus, which for the majority of people that I talk to, autofocus is the best thing um, I typically don't ever recommend you not using autofocus. Um, the only times you might not want to is if, let's say, you're taking photos where the subject matter can switch between the foreground and the background. So maybe you want to toggle between the focus manually so you can find that sweet spot where maybe the background's slightly blurry and your foreground isn't perfect, or vice versa, where your background isn't perfect. Um, perfect focused and your foreground is blurry. So that might be where I use the focus ring manually. The zoom ring though is definitely one that you're going to want to use a bunch if you have a lens that does that. It's all dependent on the style of lens that you have on there. If you have what's called a prime lens, you won't have a zoom ring on there. And the reason you won't have a zoom ring is because if a prime lens is typically one number. So it's a 50 millimeter or a 35 millimeter or a 100 millimeter. Those are going to be prime lenses that will only have a focus ring or a motor on the inside that will then allow between manual and autofocus. If you see a zoom ring, it's because your camera's or your lens is able to move between a, a different variable uh, points. So in this case, when we look at this lens, it's an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, meaning that 18 is your portrait or is your um, wide angle. The lower the number, the wider the camera lens's shot is going to be the higher the number, the tighter the number is going to be. People will say that a 50 to 100 millimeter is going to give you the, le the least amount of distortion for a portrait. So I typically recommend a 50 millimeter lens as a portrait lens. I think it works perfectly. If you're taking a picture of the kids or the family and you don't want anybody to look too big or too thin, that's the kind of lens you want to use because it'll take a perfect image of a person without with the least amount of distortion. Um, when you get into that 100 range, it's going to start distorting the image a little bit, but it's going to offer you a little more zoom. Uh, and then anything past that is just more zoom on top of that. So when you get into a lens that does 200 millimeters, it's just going to basically take you further away from a subject so you can stand back. So I get a lot of people that do bird photography or nature photography. Any lens that has extreme variable zoom on there is what's going to be able to get a further away distance from your subject um, without having to necessarily move closer with your camera. Lens retract and lens release button. Um, depending on the lens that you have, you might have a button. So I get the customers who've come in before with a buy a lens and they think the lens is broken because the, the zoom ring won't work. Sometimes you're going to have a button that actually retracts and so it keeps the lens together. Um, older lenses that don't have a motor built into them, typically what you'll see is after years of use, if you turn the lens upside down, the zoom will just literally like, gravity will like unzoom it and it's, it's kind of weird. Um, what this retract button does is it keeps the lens in place and kind of keeps the plastic, the polycarbonate, the metal from getting um, too worn out. So that zoom should be more smooth for you, but then if you turn the lens upside down, it shouldn't just like retract itself downwards. It should stay where it's at. The lens release button, for anybody who's using a mirrorless or a DSLR, if you have a point and shoot, it won't work for you, but if you have a mirrorless or DSLR, you'll be able to remove the lens from your camera and attach a different lens. Um, you know, when we're talking about a prime lens, a, I walk around with a 35 millimeter lens. That's my personal favorite because a 35 gives me slightly wide angle, not too much distortion, and then I can take a really clean portrait of a family or the girlfriend or whoever it is. Um, when I'm using a, when I'm, let's say, maybe doing like a nature hike or I'm outdoors and you know, between getting a beautiful picture of the mountainscape, but then also zooming in to see a bird that's further away, I might use something that has a little more variability to it. So something that's like a 50 to 200 millimeter lens. 
it's something where I can get a clean portrait, but then I can also zoom further away to see who I'm trying to get a picture of. And then the drive mode button on the bottom is another one. So when you're taking photos or videos, you can have a couple options as far as how the photo or how the camera's driving or operating. You'll see on the bottom of there, you'll see a stack of squares and you'll see a timer. Timer is pretty self-explanatory. If you want to set the camera up further away from you, this should give you the option of putting it down further away, walking away, and it'll do a timed photo. The one next to it will do a, um, a kind of a, what's the term I'm looking for? Continuous shoot. Yes, a continuous shoot. And you can set as many photos as you want that to be. Some of the cameras will have a specific number that it allows for, others will be unlimited. Um, typically the ones that do unlimited or do a, a very high number of continuous shooting, those are more, um, I would say, advanced or intermediate cameras. For the most part, you should see seven to 10 frames per second. That's a pretty normal number for that. So it should do a burst photo of 10 frames that then you can go through and select. So if you're doing somebody that's in motion, you might wanna do this so that way you can maybe get a clean, crisp image of them in motion while they're running or they're doing something. Um, for birds, same thing, the way that their wings are moving. If you do burst, your odds of getting the bird in full span with their wings out, no blur, it's a lot better than if you were to sit there and just hold the trigger down and hope to get that many images. Um, and then flipping the camera over, now we're going to look at where the LCD screen is. And it's more or less the same thing with a few extra buttons. You've got a menu button on there. So when you're shooting on the camera, if you're in full auto, you won't have any extra control over the camera's features. The camera will do everything for you. When you click menu button, that's where you can get to things like autofocus, you can get to um, how your camera is taking photo quality, so if it's just doing JPEG or raw photo. Um, if you have a camera that has multiple SD card slots, this is where you can toggle between where the uh, card is being saved to, SD slot 1 or 2. Um, in the menu button, you can switch the way your autofocus is going, so if it's single point autofocus, multi point autofocus, wide angle autofocus, or if you want to do manual focus, that's all stuff you can set in the menu. But anything that doesn't involve f-stop, aperture, or your shutter speed, or ISO, your fourth one, that's all done in your menu button settings. Um, for the most part, it's pretty, um, I would say it's up to the photographer what they want to change in the menu settings. There's no one way to do things. There's no wrong way to do things. Um, but the menu gives you full access to the internal settings on the camera that you wouldn't be able to change with the mode dial or the command dial. Your diopter adjustment, so, man, oh man. Oh man, this is not a good signal today. All right, so diopter. Diapter adjustment. So when you're looking through your viewfinder on the top there, you might see that the um, picture looks a little blurry, but you have autofocus turned on. Your eye just isn't reading correctly with the diap with the physical viewfinder. Using the diapter adjustment will help how your eye is seeing it in there. So it's important that when you first get the camera, or if let's say you haven't picked the camera up in years and you want to use the U viewfinder, play with the diapter adjustment on there just to make sure that when your eye is up to the camera, it's exactly how you want it to be. Uh, let's see, info button from there. If you're taking photos and you're in the photo playback button, which if we go down a little bit from info button, we'll see a play or a triangle in a square. We can call that a play symbol in a square. If you're in image playback and you click the info button, what the info button will do is it'll break down a bunch of information about the image that you just took. It'll tell you, if you're, especially if you're shooting on auto, I, I use this all the time for my beginning students. Um, if you're in auto and you click the image playback button, you'll be able to get all of the stats that, you, that the camera used to take your photo. So if you're in full auto, you take a photo of this backpack sitting on the shelf there, you go to image playback and then you click the info button it should tell you what aperture it was used at, what f-stop it was used at, what the exposure light was used at. So if you're someone who is trying to move from auto to a full manual or an f-stop uh, or a 
um, shutter speed priority or aperture priority, this could be a good way for you to learn what the camera is dictating is, is made to take a good photo. Uh, and then it might give you kind of a cheat code or a shortcut to where to set your camera when you're first starting to take photos on full manual or full exposure. From there we have focus exposure lock. Um, so depending on when you're shooting, there's a bunch of stuff that comes up on the camera. The focus and exposure lock will keep the focus and exposure locked in place or it'll unlock it, allow you to change it. So that's a toggle between the two that when you're using the camera. OK button, or sorry, the information button, the I button. I button is another set of settings that when you click it, it'll open up a bunch of different features on the camera, allow you to change and edit things. Uh, typically, it's, it's another menu button in some cases, but every camera does it a little bit different with the I button. Um, but every camera, for the most part, has an I button on there. OK button underneath that, pretty self-explanatory if you are changing settings on the camera, if you're deleting photos, if you're going through anything, the OK button is your button to then hit enter, to hit OK, to move on to the next step. Multi-selector is how you're rotating from there. So, you know, if you're using like a home remote, if you're, let's say you're watching TV, think about how your TV remote functions. You have the arrows that then move you from menu to menu or from part to part. You'd click OK from there and then that would take you further into the setting or save the setting. Same thing is here. When you're using the multi-selector, that could be a way that you're going through your photos to see what you've taken already. Um, that could be a way for you to change certain things if you're switching between autofocuses. Um, that could also be a way for you to um, select and deselect certain things. The multi-selector and the OK button go hand in hand, and that's your way of navigating the menu. From there you have your magnifier and your demagnifier. Pretty self-explanatory, but for those that don't know, when you click the image playback button and you use the magnifier or demagnify, it's a really easy way for you to zoom into the photo that you've just taken. For those who have touchscreen LCDs on the back, you should be able to also just go like this and do this motion on the screen. That'll zoom in or zoom out of the photo. But if you don't have that and you have a screen that you have to physically manually control with your multi-selector and OK button, that's where you can use the magnifier and demagnifier. It's a great tool to use, especially if you want to see how clear your image is and you want to make sure you took a clear photo. Zooming in on the photo to see how far you can get before the pixels become blurry, it's a great way to see the clarity of your photo, to see what you can crop out and play with. But that should be it for the tour of your camera. Um, that just kind of goes over all of the basic buttons that you'll see on any camera that you'll purchase, at least for the ongoing future. This is, I mean, so for example, Nikon is slowly going to be discontinuing their DSLR lineup. You're going to see DSLR cameras go bye-bye within, I'd say, at least five to seven years. Mirrorless is going to become the future. It's the only thing you're going to see. You're going to see models of point-and-shoots that don't have any interchangeable lenses, and you're going to see only mirrorless cameras within the next five to seven years. If you have a DSLR, I guarantee you're still going to see accessories, lenses, and everything else for the next 20 years or so before those start going. But manufacturer-wise, you won't see any more new DSLRs hitting the shelves. Um, but the button layouts should be the same going forward until some new unexplained feature comes out on a camera that justifies a new button creation. The mode dial, which is the next thing we're going to go into, is where things start to change. So I put an example of all the different ones up here. If I remember correctly, you should have a Sony model in the top left corner there. You should have a Canon on the right corner there, and then below should be your Nikon. I could have gotten those mixed up. But when you look across all the different dials, it all kind of looks the same, give or take a few extra, I'd say, skews or things there. You're going to see an A. Your A is going to be your intelligent auto, your standard auto, but whatever is basically going to do all of the work for you. That's your auto button. From there, you'll get into manual exposure. That's where you are allowed to do anything that you want as a photographer. You can manipulate the f-stop, the aperture, the shutter speed. You have full control over what you're taking and how things look. Aperture priority means that the camera, and that you're going to see that as an AV or A or a, a, um, 
Yeah, you're gonna see it as an AV, an AE, or an A. Uh, auto for like the uh, can, um, Nikon number over there on the bottom, auto is spelled out, auto. Um, a is gonna be your aperture priority on there. So with aperture, that's gonna dictate how big the iris of the camera gets. So when you think of a camera, if we think of the inside of a lens, the metal shutter is kind of the way that uh, an iris would look. So it's a tiny little dot. And as you change that aperture size, it's gonna then keep increasing and getting bigger and bigger. When you're doing that, the camera itself will change and play with all the other settings by itself. So it'll go through the whole nine yards and get you the best photo. You, as the photographer, have the ability to then decide what your aperture is going to be. And we'll talk about next week why that's important and what kind of um, artistic choices you can take when you're using an aperture priority would be. But that's an example. Shutter priority. Easiest way I can describe shutter is it's the speed of which the camera is closing that iris. Um, so the metal iris that's moving with the aperture, that's what's being dictated with that AV. From there, the shutter priority is what dictates how fast that's going to close. So you can do it where it closes within a second. You can make it close within 320ths of a second. Um, the speed of which you make it close dictates how much light the camera absorbs, and then also dictates how fast it's going to grab that image. The faster you do it, um, the harder it is for the camera to see what's in front of it because it'll do it so fast that it can't necessarily read the light, can't necessarily read the dark points on there, and you get a blurry image. If you do it too slow, you get a very oversaturated image that might not give you the right information. So it's finding the sweet spot with that. Um, but aperture priority is a great way if, let's say, you're taking photos where you have a background and a foreground that are really important to you, and you want to make sure that you can build a good relationship between the two. Um, my example could be if you're taking family photos and you're at the Pyramids of Giza. If you're standing in front of the pyramids, the pyramids are almost as important as your kids or your husband or whoever it is. So you'd want to make sure that you're setting your aperture at a priority that gives both the background and the foreground the same amount of detail and attention. If you're using something like shutter speed, what you're really looking for is how fast you want to grab that image. If you're taking a picture of the dog running around the park, you might set it a little bit faster because if they're moving, you want to get them in a clean, crisp shot. If you're taking photos of birds, same idea. You want to get a clean image of it, especially when their wingspan is out. You don't want to blurry on the wings. Uh, you don't want blur on the wings. You want a nice, clean, open image. Um, something maybe where you're on a tripod and you have a still setting in front of you that's not moving, then you can do whatever aperture you want. You can set it for as long as you want because there's no shakiness. There's nothing moving in front of you. Program is going to be another one where you can set it. It's very similar to auto, um, or uh, to manual, I should say. The difference with program is that where manual you are consistently changing and you can do anything you want with it. Program, you can set it to do whatever you want it to be. And every time you go back to program, it'll automatically go back to that exact same setting. If you go from shutter priority to manual, whatever it was just doing on shutter priority, it's going to do, start doing it on manual, but then you can control it if that makes sense. Um, the way I think about it is like if you were playing a video game of some sort, certain levels are locked while you're playing. Uh, you have to unlock those levels. When you're using manual, everything is unlocked to you. You can go to any level that you want. When you're using aperture or uh, shutter priority, certain levels are locked, you're stuck to one thing. And when you move from a shutter priority or aperture priority to manual, um, you are basically going from locked to unlocked. So whatever what settings were on aperture and shutter priority, it'll move over to manual and then you gotta change those. If you're in the program setting, then whatever you had there, and whatever you used previously should stick with you and you'll be able to use them again. That's one of those settings I typically don't teach program ever. It's, it's a very personal one. Typically the big ones everybody wants to know about are manual, aperture, and shutter. I recommend until next week when we go over those a little more in detail, stick to auto until then. Just so that way you can get the meat and potatoes of taking a photo. From there, depending on the other ones that you have, so on the bottom there the Nikon has seen. 
And scene is a fancier version of auto. It's supposed to just be crisper, cleaner, give a little more design, a little more flair to it. Canon does something similar, where when you look on Canons, you'll see a nighttime. You'll see a sport. You'll see a kids. You'll see a landscape. All of those are auto features. They're just specifically made auto to do something a little more artistic. Sony could care less about that, and so they just do Auto Plus, which is their scene intelligent auto. Their auto is supposed to read the image as best as it can and dictate out of all of those extra features that you could use on a Canon or a Nikon what to use the most. So depending on what brand you're using, again, they're all going to have just about the same thing. They're all just going to do it a little bit differently. Just talked about the mode dial a little bit, but this is a good one if you want to take a photo of this one. Um, the one I didn't talk about is B. Bulb is fully customizable, but the nice part with bulb, and the best way I can describe this, and I think I have some examples, is long exposure. If you're somebody who wants to take a photo of the fireworks, you've got a beautiful display for the 4th of July, fireworks are going off like crazy, you'll sometimes see cool images where the fireworks look like every single firework went off in the sky at once, but everything in the foreground and everything in the background looked the same. It's because they used this bulb setting. And what they did was they put the camera on a tripod, they set it up so that way the light and everything was correct down there, but when they held down the trigger, it stayed open during the entire fireworks display and you get these light streaks that go through the air. You'll see people take photos like this when they take pictures of like overpasses where traffic is moving. It's really cool when you can see the street lights do this cool like streaking. Um, some people will take sparklers and they'll actually write stuff out or do messages with the sparklers. And when you have long exposure, it captures all of that and it just makes a really cool looking image. Um, but that would be the ball program on there, which again, is more of a fun, artsy one. I would say your big ones to focus on are the top four. Auto, full control over the, or the camera does everything for you, you point and shoot. Manual, you control everything that the camera has as far as function. Aperture priority, you control that iris that I was telling you about and how big and small that gets. And then shutter speed, how fast is that iris closing. Start with auto. It's the easiest one, it'll give you the least amount of headaches. If you use that info button too after you use auto, you can get a better idea of what the camera was able to pick up for you, um, which might again help influence you when you start to get into manual and those other settings, what you're looking for, or what you should set your camera to, to then get a similar image. Scenes, again, if you are someone who uses a um, Sony camera, you're most likely not gonna have scenes. If you're someone who has a Canon camera, you'll see all those on there. And if you're someone with a Nikon camera, you'll see scenes on there, the SCN. Um, certain models might not have it. It depends on which one you got. Um, most of the um, higher end ones or the intermediate ones, so most of the DSLRs and mirrorless that you see should have a variation of this that you're able to go through. Point and shoot cameras would be an example of some that you might not see with that. Um, your model should have some of those dials on there, if I'm not mistaken, too. Yeah. 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 My camera doesn't work. This is, I get this all the time from customers. This is a great example of think through when you're taking a photo. Um, again, it's not like using your phone where when you take your phone out, you just take a quick snapshot, you're done, there's your photo and it looks clean. Cameras take a little bit more love and patience with it. Um, you know, if you take a camera out of the box and you point it at something and you take a picture and it turns up like this, um, I mean, what do you expect? You just you picked it up and you did nothing with it. You got it. That's where you have to know a little bit more than just the uh, the shutter button on there. And that's where again our class kind of takes off. Is the idea is that you need to understand what's on your camera as a whole, even if you don't know how to use 80% of the features, if you know where to look for them, you can then take a better photo than something like this. Um, from here, we're gonna go more into now composition of photos. When you're taking a photo, what to look for when you're setting it up and how to just take a clean image. So your camera isn't a smartphone, going back into it. Um, your camera is a camera. It is an advanced piece of equipment that can read a, um, read a space really well, determine light, determine saturation, determine um, focus, um, lights, uh, 
everything. It, it dictates the relationship that you have with whatever the subject is. When you're using a cell phone, the cell phone has so many auto auto everything in there um, that it automatically takes whatever you want with a pretty ease, with pretty much um, the most ease and the most clarity possible. But if you're looking for something that has good color saturation, that has um, different lighting dynamics, that actually looks more advanced than just a snapshot, that's where then the camera really comes into effect. Starting with holding your camera, it seems pretty simple, but I see a lot of people that take they have just terrible posture with their photos, and I just feel bad for their backs. Um, I'm, in, I'm a drawer, and I've already been told by so many doctors how, many, uh, how much arthritis I'm going to have when I'm in the future just because of the way I have to hold a paintbrush or a pencil. Um, you know, a camera isn't far off. It's five or six pounds that you're holding in your hand, and if you arch your back too much or you mess with your neck, that's where you can get the hump in your neck or you can get lower back problems. So it's important to make sure Stand up straight and tall with it. Um, don't lean into it too much. That's where, number one, you look silly when you do it, but number two, um, you're gonna hurt your back over time with it. When you're holding the camera, it's important to remember the, where the weight distribution is within it. If you have something with a bigger telephoto lens on there, there's gonna be a lot more weight on the front of the camera versus the back. And if you have a bigger body camera, like let's say um, the Canon um, 6D, which is a pretty hefty camera, um, there's all the weight on the back of it which could then tend the camera to tip up. So two things, a neck strap is awesome for a camera. It's a big support. If you tug on that neck strap while you're taking a photo, you've automatically got more stabilization in between taking a photo um, and your neck too. The grip on the camera is nice if you keep on the side and on the bottom with that distribution. But if you look at both the gentleman on the bottom and then our uh, female in the top corner there, when their arms are like this, you have the ability to, to push them into your body, which then also gives you more stabilization. So depending on where you're at, if the strap isn't cutting it where you can pull or if it's causing tension on the neck, taking your arms and locking them into your sides and just kind of stuffing them there, that really helps keep the camera stable and non-shaky. And then you'll notice that you won't have the trembling in your hands. Um, but posture and holding your camera, it's as, as important as actually taking a photo. Focus, then shoot, shoot through the picture. Focus the camera first. If you're someone who's experimenting and trying to do all these artistic features or artistic things, by all means, um, take a photo, don't focus, don't look, just shoot, have fun with it. But if you're really trying to get a crisp image and take as few photos as possible, focus, and then shoot through the picture. Um, I typically recommend when you've got your subject in front of you and you know what you want to take, you, you as the photographer look behind them as best as you can. There's that joke that Michael Jordan, when he would shoot the free throws, um, he wouldn't look at the front of the rim, he would look at the back of the rim through the net. That was his way of then be, being able to place the basketball in the net. When you're the photographer, if you look at your subject and then you try to look past them, you're shooting through them, which again, helps when you're trying to focus and it's just a good school of thought to take a cleaner photo. If you are moving, your camera's moving, therefore your photos can become blurry. This is a great example of just take the time to lock your arms into place, invest in a tripod, put padding on the neck strap so that way it's a little bit easier on the tension there. Um, anything you can do to keep that camera steady is always gonna result in a better image. Basics for taking the great photos. So fill frame, multiple ways to look at this. Um, I like to sit in the category of the less negative or dead space that you have, the better your image turns out to be. When we look at the subject matter in this one, on the left, it's not a bad photo, it's clean, it's crisp, but the negative space around her, the wall and the edging of the wall, the molding, is kind of useless. There's really no point for it. The subject matter is all set on her, so clearing up that frame and filling it makes a cleaner image, brings more attention to the subject. It works for some things, it works for it doesn't work for others. Um, but a really clean, easy way to take your photos and make them look nicer is when you're shooting, do your best to fill the frame. Eyes in the top third. 
So if we take this photo and we divide three lines or two lines into the photo, we have a bottom quadrant, a top quadrant, and then or a bottom, middle, and top quadrant. If we look at his eyes, his eyes are just at about where the top, where the middle line would go that separates the top and the middle quadrant. Um, doing that draws our eyes a little bit further up. This kind of falls into place with the rule of thirds, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But by putting things in a, the top quadrant of a photo or in the top third of a photo, naturally our eyes are going to be drawn to it. Um, that's a good example. Focusing in on the eyes. So if you're doing portraits, if you're doing uh, family, if you're out on vacation, if you're not as concerned about the background, let's say you're in front of a palm tree, you want to get a nice picture of um, your daughter, your son, your husband, your wife in front of the tree, you might want to focus in on their eyes. The eyes are naturally going to be picked up by the cameras. Most of your cameras have an advanced eye tracking software. Nikon's famous for theirs because Nikon's tracks both humans and animals. Um, Canon's been getting better with that and Sony's tracking system is amazing as well too. Um, but when you're focusing in, the camera has an easier time latching onto the eye because it's automatically trying to reduce red eye, which used to be a big problem with the old uh, point and shoot cameras, with your old photo film cameras. Um, so naturally, cameras have an easier time looking and sensing the eye. So when you focus on the eye, you're able to get a cleaner, crisper image. There's not a lot of blur on there. The hair is a little out of focus. Um, but the main subject, which would be her face and her eye color, we can see all that. Get on their level. This is more for kids or for, I'd say, insect photography or flower or like plant-based photography. It always sounds funny when I say that kids and insects in the same sentence. Uh, but getting on the level of what you're taking a photo of can help a lot. When you look at this photo, we're shooting from above, which kind of feels like we're shooting down at the kids, which we are. Because of that, there's like a power dynamic that's built in this, and this feels more of like a snapshot and less of a photo. This feels like something you would take a picture of on your phone and like text it to your friends to say like, oh, here's the party that I'm at right now for, the, for my son's birthday or what, what have you. Versus jumping down a little bit to where then they're on the same plane as you. This then also goes into kind of that rule of thirds, but then eyes in the top quadrant. So if we look at the daughter in the background, her eyes would be on the top third of the photo. His eyes are the main focus, and we're filling the frame as best as we can. But because we're taking those steps, a photo like this, if let's say maybe we focused on the girl in the green shirt, if we drop down a little bit and we were to take a photo with that, it probably would have more of a look like this, which feels more intentional, feels like a thought out photo that has a little more composition built into it than the family shot does. Uh, nothing wrong with this one. I think that this is truly a candid moment. The kids with the star glasses always make me laugh. Um, but again, if you're someone who's trying to take a cleaner, crisper image that has more professional look to it, getting down onto a level where you're at the same eye focus as them and you're able to just get a little bit more detail and focus in can make a picture go from a snapshot to a more detailed, thought out photo. Or lower. Um, Always pointing your camera up towards something brings in a certain magnification, which at the same time, too, in our human brains kind of gives a, an importance to a subject. Um, so if you are below and you're shooting upwards, our eyes naturally kind of get this sense of bigger or a sense of more important um, from that. Um, so that's another idea or another tool that you can implement when you're taking photos of either kids, uh, insects, animals, or I would say any like flowers or anything that's basically low to the ground where it's not going to be on the same plane as you. Now let's talk about the rule of thirds and I'll show a bunch of examples. But when I talked about dividing a subject into a top, a bottom, or a, a bottom, middle, and top quadrant, the same can be said for a right, center, and left quadrant all of which then pertains to the rule of thirds. And the idea is that if you divide a picture or subject matter into three different sections, there's going to be two lines or two intersecting points on the, on the image where if you line a subject matter up with them, naturally the human's eye is going to be more drawn to that 
um, which can lead to more intentional or uh, subliminal photo taking depending on what you're looking for. So example with the grids on the surfer. To start to something I mentioned at the very beginning of class before everybody showed up, uh, I talked about the horizon line. And the horizon line is a big tool in the drawing and in the painting community. When you have a horizon line, you have a line that's dividing your background and your foreground or where the sky touches the ground. The horizon line would be where the sky meets the water in the background there. So we have our horizon line in the back, so that's separating our background and our foreground. That's a great tool to use when you're trying to take a photo. Keeping that horizon line centered can lead to just a more pleasing image to the eye. But putting that aside, we have our subject matter on our third line, or on our middle line there, so he's on the rule of thirds line. There's two intersecting points where we can see where the circles were from before, so if we go from this image to this one. The surfer is in the one, and his shadow is in the bottom one. Um, there's another rule that I talk about. I might get into it in this presentation. But with this one, um, there is the sun on the back. Um, when you're taking a photo of somebody, if you keep the sun behind the subject matter or behind yourself, you get less of a glare and less of this kind of uh, blinding light that moves around the subject matter. In this case, because we keep the light behind him, we're keeping the subject matter dark, but the sub sunlight is subdued in the back. We get a little bit of shine in between his legs, which is a little overwhelming, but it's pleasing in this case, and it's not a, a bad quality to have with this one. But we're following the rule of thirds. We have a nice horizon line, and we have a clean image that our eye kind of naturally follows. Another one, a lot of these are at the beach. Uh, if I had other examples, I would give them, but a lot of beach photos. Same one in this kind of case. Our girl is off to the left side there. She falls nicely on that line. Our horizon line is perfect with that top quadrant line. The sun is all behind our subject, and it's in the clouds too, so it's a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? And yeah, diffused. So we don't get as harsh of a sunlight too. But it cleans the photo up. The black and white too also helps play with the light on there too, so the sunlight could be a little bit more bright, but because of the black and white we don't pick it up or read it as much. But I imagine that, this, that the clouds diffuse the light really well. Another rule of thirds, but now this one kind of doubles up on everything. So this also uses convecting, or um, uses uh, what I like to call uh, vanishing lines too. So we have our horizon line in the background, and if you look really closely, there's a couple of the, where the brick building and then the side fence over there, where they come in, you'll see that there's kind of a line where the, the background and the foreground meet. It's hidden behind her arm, um, by the daughter's arm, but you can kind of see it in the back there. If you follow these lines, they all go into a point that's called the vanishing point. So all of these buildings and lines kind of naturally all go into one point, further further away in the subject line. So you have a horizon line again. You have a vanishing point. Your buildings, your building and your fence follow that line and go to the background. So everything kind of points to the center of the photo. On top of that too, you have the parents and the kids on the rule of thirds lines. The mom, I would say, is the only one that's kind of messing it up. Um, if the mom was just over slightly, they would be perfectly in the center just like the kids are. Or you could say that if the daughter just moved over an inch or two, she would then be perfectly in place. But they're following the rule enough that if you were a photographer setting this photo up, this would be a really nice, pleasing image to give to clients or that you could set up for your own family. And then good old Jim Helpert from The Office, another great example. Um, when they were doing The Office, if you ever watched this, these scenes where they do like these little mock interviews in The Office, you'll notice that they're always positioned off-center of the camera, and that is on purpose. That's to follow the rule of thirds and to put that into practice. Um, there's nothing going on in his subject matter on there, so they could have gone in and done him in the full frame like we talked about earlier. But in the case of doing the mockumentary style filming, it was probably more appropriate to keep him off-center and then show that they're in an office setting and whatnot. So location was more important on this one than filling the frame. Going back into the sun on the back. So bad, better. 
if we look up there, we can see that the sun is not quite behind him. We can see a little bit of light bleeding over, but because the sun is not really bleeding over, we don't have any light on his face. We don't have any kind of dictation towards like color. Uh, everything feels a little muddy. And then on top of that too, the fish being in his face doesn't help either. He moves the fish off to the side. The sunlight is positioned a little bit better in this case, so he's more illuminated. The fish is out of his face, so he, light, he lights up immediately too. But you can just see how much brighter he is on his legs and then on his shirt even too, and even on the hat. The hat's a royal blue color, but in the top photo it almost looks navy. Um, little things that can just make your photo turn out a lot better, even if you're taking a photo of a bug or uh, a weed that's outside. Timer and camera app. So we talked about that button on the bottom of continuous or timing for, um, timing shooting. If you're trying to take multiple frames a second or if you're trying to um, take um, pictures of um, yourself but you needed to go on a timer, you can do that on the camera. But a lot of these cameras, as we were just talking about, have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on there. Nikon uses SnapBridge, my Fujifilm uses a Fuji app on there, Sony has their own, Canon has their own. Sony is really nice too because they have a couple apps to use, so if one app doesn't work for you, you can download another one. Um, but they're great tools for either photo editing software, for like a cheaper version of it, um, for saving the photos to your phone, but then using the self-timer, using all these other features, shutter, um, all great ways for you to take exciting photos, especially if you're by yourself using the camera, if you don't have someone to take a photo of you. Recommended accessories. I always like to talk about certain things. So we talk about a lot of different things um, with external hard drives, with memory cards. If I were a brand new photographer and I needed to just have the very bare minimum, I would want a camera with at least one lens, maybe two lenses, but one lens is good enough for me. I'd like a filter on the lens. I believe in either using a polarized or UV filter lens. Polarized is nice if you're on water or if you're taking photos with intense snow. Um, you can get what's called snow blindness. Um, technically, if you're in the mountains and you're moving around, if you are in the snow, then it's untouched and the sun is beating on it, technically a human can go blind within 10 minutes of being on the mountains. Um, but if you're taking photos or if let's say you're in the like, you know, you're rock climbing, you're out in the snow area, or maybe you're out in the middle of the ocean taking photos, the bright reflection that comes off the sun can a lot of the times damage our eyes, but then also kind of damage the camera a little bit and blend out, bleed out the photos. Putting on a filter helps a little bit and then helps diffuse um, intense light or uh, non-intentional light that we don't want as a photographer. But I would get a bag at least one to two memory cards, any lenses that I needed, and then the uh, lens filters. Having all of that to start I think is enough. Extra battery, I think get that later on as you're shooting. See if you physically need an extra battery or if you can just get away with a day of shooting. If you're doing a lot of video, that's where you might want to use that extra battery. It really pays off. Um, but tripods are really big. Monopods are nice too if you're traveling a lot. The monopod could be set up stationary, and you can use the can use the monopod stability to take a clean photo without necessarily taking the full tripod setup. I like the monopod a lot, um, but tripods are great if you're doing long exposures, bulb exposures. Um, if you're just someone who naturally has a shaky hand, tripods are really nice. You can get aluminum, which is a little bit cheaper. Uh, carbon fiber is pricey, but it's worth it, especially if you're doing a safari or if you're doing things where you're going to be moving a lot. Um, getting a better strap is a good option. They give you a strap with most of the cameras you get, but there's no padding on there. There's no, really no, no meat and potatoes. So look into a strap. Some people like to get crazy with it and get nice genuine leather. Other people get straps that are this thick that have memory foam padding. You can do anything you want. Um, and then lens cleaning kits. Um, again, you can get those at any time, but if, especially if you're someone who's taking your lens off. I, my hands sweat all the time. It's so gross when I touch my lens, so I like a good lens cleaning kit myself. And then just keep taking classes and workshops. I can't stress enough how awesome of a resource YouTube is. Um, anytime I want to know something that I don't know, if I YouTube it, I can get an answer within five minutes. Um, you use YouTube, use the internet, 
use online sources. Um, as much information as you can scoop up about these cameras, you're better off than before you started. Um, taking this class is a great step to learn more about it, um, but there's obviously more that you can do to get better. And then that's really all we have now. We've got about 20 minutes left so we can answer questions and do that. But for anybody that doesn't know, next Thursday will be the second Thursday of the month, so we'll do intermediate classes. Um, intermediate classes kind of cover everything from f-stop, aperture, shutter speed priority. We talk a little bit more about composition and lighting in a little more in further detail. Um, but we really go over the trifecta of your camera setup in more detail. Um, so if you want to graduate from using um, auto and using scenes where the camera does everything for you, next week is when you want to come because then we'll really get into full detail with that. But on that note, I don't see anybody on the chat saying anything. Anybody online has anything to say, please comment right now. I'll answer it for you. But in person, what kind of questions do you guys have? So on this camera, it doesn't seem to have like an info button. Okay. So with that one, if you play, hit the playback button, then we can take a look. There should be something that you're able to press that'll yeah. then give you all the info. Oh, okay. So, so it does have a playback button. Yeah. Oh, we should have a playback. Yeah. Okay, 
display. Yeah, that's so, using it? Maybe that's it. Yeah, it just depends what you're looking at. That's probably what it is. Like, and you oh. mentioned this uh, sometimes left the two less details. Sometimes. It depends on the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think if you only have yeah. one, yeah. the easiest way to check would be where it is. Okay. 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 But that's exactly and right. Nine, so please. when you start shooting on auto, the yeah. more photos you take, and then let's say you get a photo that's great, right right then, then yeah. that's when you can click the display I button. Can't see that and part. Part. Sorry. <laughs> So you can uh, do this on any picture yeah. you can take. Yeah, they don't know how to read it. <laughs> so you can find. So if there's one it's picture that came out better than the rest of them, oh, what you know, like, what did I do for that one? Even though it's using auto, clicking that display button will then break down all the photos information. So the, the biometrics of the photo. Wow. Wow. Pretty neat. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody can think of? Yeah. Well, I have the info, but I have no idea what it's telling me. So it's <laughs> <laughs> the purpose. I mean, you know, right? Some of them is, are going to be a little like, okay, so that's so the info. I that is the info. So oh, the so easiest way to read this guide card. is if we go. Usually just when I'm playing around. Oh, so I've never done a more like so oh, okay. And more so just to play because Let's if I'm traveling, I will so do I will do one of the couple things. On the top there, it's going to show you all the information. So this was a photo that I will transfer straight into what I my drive style. So that was so I transfer and I always copy you click display, like he yeah, said, and then you I make sure I all the photos that, says that I had 300 photos that day, the, 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 the 300 photos being copy, so just being okay. and then, then you don't pay for Dropbox, right? I pay 130 This again, okay. ISO but is 800. I 2 terabytes. Oh, it's showing that it's using one terabyte of color. So this information I, is know, more of something that you'd want to use if you were going to If I don't have any Wi-Fi, I'll try to just Let's say that going from on to OS um, that and we get um, horrible Wi-Fi. Uh, I actually you're using a raw photo transfer and you're Photoshop afterwards. Um, when I travel with the camera for multiple days, the for you, I, so I, I set it. up that's where folders for each effect. day. And then I transfer photos every day, especially so it's not confusing. Like if you wait until you get home, and in this case, you know, I mean, that's the bunch of stuff when I get home. So it tells you that there. When it shows you that it's really cool. And then the next one we get. So I will create set folders up like day one. It's interesting because when I do that, the computer actually sets it up by the day. So I just want you to have the date and all the pictures. Right, so I do, like this was the trip we just But I don't do anything. I set this up by Dropbox, but then once I need my Wi Fi, was bad. Yeah. The is of the, the I actually did it on my phone because so I have this set up there and I started to move it here. And then I, it was quicker to move to my phone than because I didn't need Wi Fi. I would have to go to the board with me. So for the PC, sports, I do it by core. I that's the new one. I do it by core also. And I wonder if that's because I have a little table higher than there or a little bit I just put it into my folders. Right. Yeah. And then <laughs> if I'm going to Photoshop, so, so the higher the number, the faster. Yes. Later. Um, yeah. Because think of it this way. That's then a second. I just, so every day I make a point the of moving so the photos and the then closes, so I don't down get a blur. You know, when I'm starting to look at a baby, later because it, you know, just kind of where was I? What am I doing? I don't know. Right. Um, and when you're but like, in the initial channel, the keys don't match the you know, <laughs> screw me up in Africa once. I mean, it's like know, a different day, and I'm like, crap. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. this now. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I set yeah. it all yeah. up in advance, yeah. oh, so and then nice. I move my photos, and I bring all the cords so that I can go from the camera to this. I just saw a uh, photo so trans the older the older models had on there, the cars, whenever you do eventually more upgrade or change cameras, this you'll notice that really all of those are yeah. oh, one. Oh, yeah, right. so, so this so one takes yeah. and so one the classes you should actually do it online mm -hmm. as I did. So, with all this stuff. So if you go um, on I just site, got it for this page, camera, but then I need like something where the videos my PC won't accept that. So my understanding, so like it's, it's, it's a Nikon, it's a mirrorless. So, um, 
So is that a half of different values that you have to put I have, that? so. Uh, so actually, I also know that. So bought you what? this so lens, and I bought. Take a look at the lens real quick. Well, so this is the C series, and they have a huge amount of lenses. And I had a bunch of lenses with my last Nikon. So I have an adapter where you can adapt to this, to the Z. So I, I, I'm primarily zoom. So this one is 24 to 70. Um, when we just came back, I brought it 200 to 500. So he's talking about weight. So I was, you know, my room still hurts some days. Well, that, that's why I got this one. This is, you know, it's called Rich Beauty. Right. So it also goes from 24 to 50. The 2000 treatment, I saw that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you're I, uh, I have a, you know, the P600, which one gets us 24, 14, 41, which, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, so, so like, you know, we've done a number of different things like that, and, 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 you know, and the animals are way far away. Where did you go in Africa? Because I was going to say, the one we went on there, most people need to need just a cell phone. Yeah, well, this was perfect. Uh, well, right yeah, we've been to a we did a little high you know, uh, thing, thing in the in the uh, shop. Oh, did you? Oh, nice. And then we did two sub This is that. We did Tanzania. Oh, yeah. Oh, we did Tanzania. We did Tanzania twice. I don't think that changed. No, it's just not. It's not going to be perfect. Not everyone. I prefer close. They're literally next to you. Right. Yeah. You know, in South Africa, and then they're farther away. Yeah. So, so for now you want for Africa or we went to Africa and I brought. I, I only needed slice a long zoom and once you learn a little for rhinos. Everything else was yeah, was, yeah. was was pretty yeah. much. Well, right. he was getting frustrated with the camera face though. Right. And I would just stay up for the way when I was getting high and I'd be trying to focus and it wouldn't even work. Well, the P600 was much. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we were, so I I had a, like a, Fifty to three hundred zoom, which is, to be honest, I, I, I was constantly changing lenses because the animals kept, you know, they may start up and they're like right next to your vehicle, and and then I had my phone, so I'm like, I had a bag with all the pockets that I was facing. But uh, you know, like we saw a lion that's in the tree. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, we were able to get that. And then, you know, the elephant came and scared the lion. And she came and it'll change the way things look. Chasing her. So I was able to get a number of them. But it was off in the distance because, you know, where our driver stopped. Take a photo oh. with it in regular auto and then take a photo so, with superior you know, auto. It worked out well. And then, you know, you know, it was a superior you know, auto color. Really, you know, uh, uh, yeah, 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 I just, yeah, I was just a lot of the question. Watching. This one here, is this just yeah. to view? Or does it affect the picture? It doesn't affect the picture. It affects how your eyes are seeing the exact picture. I was just confused with exactly yeah. what diopter changes, but I think of it like people yeah. for an eye exam. Yeah. The doctor says so they flip the right. thing for me to see which is better. Yeah, it's a. When you get binoculars, that's the same thing. You know, binoculars on the chips that will be out of the center. It had trouble focusing on the other focal lines. And then also, the shutter was pretty good. You were already trying to see the picture. You made a lot of your kids took the car. Same thing with the eyes. Oh, yeah, because by the time you finally take it, the. You, you've lost your uh, subject. You said the subject. Right, and that's um, because I was just got, um, having, got, um, in Africa, it was just kind of such crazy. We wound up seeing which we had that. 
Well, we saw it like it was like non stop, which we had never seen so many. Nice. Oh my god, that is awesome. That's awesome. This class comes for a higher Oh, this is on the so in Tanzania, the problem is because the elephants are constantly scratching their heads, the trees are like this, and, and, and they're dying out because, you know, well, they, 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 they actually say, you know, what I know. 
Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about cameras as a used car. I talk about yeah, cell phones right. and cameras as cars. Right. Yeah. Second you get that thing off the lot, yeah. good luck. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I already lost that. Yeah. Well, I had, I got rid of my, I, I forgot if I had a D8000 or whatever, okay. and I thought, and so I priced it, and I, think I paid some ungodly amount of money, and I think they said like a hundred bucks. So I gave it to a friend of ours who's young, who loves to take pictures. I'm like, here, and she's like, oh my God. I'm like, yeah, you know, you think it's such a gift, but I, you know, yeah, I'd yeah. sell it if I could. Yeah. 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 Well, with this camera, we still use film. So yeah. And that was what? Yeah, all right. That was a long I, I had a customer today who came in, and she was like, I remember getting a camera for like 300 bucks. She's like, what do you got? I want to get my daughter one. And I kind of like looked at her, and I was like, well, uh, 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 I was like, you got a cell phone? She's like, she's too young for a cell phone. I'm like, how's seven hundred dollars sound for an intro camera? Even, mm-hmm. Did you see the the Polaroids are are back? And they call, my grandson wanted one for Christmas. Thanks I'm like, this, you're one. kidding! And they cost a lot of money. Yeah. And it's a freaking Polaroid. Yeah. Records well, are becoming popular. Oh, that we have lots of records and the flip phones are starting to come back. <laughs> Everything exactly. recycles itself. Exactly. See you next Thursday. Have a good one, guys. Thanks. Be safe. <laughs> have a good one. All right, I still have a few viewers on here. Class just left, guys. Uh, I didn't see anything in the chat, but thank you, guys, everybody, for staying put, for being here. Uh, we'll be back again next Thursday for the second class for the intermediate. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody that showed up today. I really appreciate y'all. And uh, 